Today we're going to look at articulations. Articulations are where two bones come into contact with each other. We might have almost no movement at this connection, or we could have lots of movement or something in between. What you're seeing in this example is something known as a diarthrosis or synovial joint. In these types of joints, there's lots of movement. So on the right, we have a photograph of a human cadaver that has been sectioned through the shoulder in the frontal plane. And you can see there is a joint cavity of physical space between the head of the humerus and the scapula. So we're looking at the glenoid cavity here. That space is gonna be filled with fluid and that fluid will allow for free movement. You have lots of movement at your shoulder joint. It is the most movable of all your joints. When we're classifying joints and defining joints, we can do it based on several different characteristics. We can look at the functional aspects of the joint, how much movement occurs at the joint. We can look at the structural aspects of the joint. Is there a space between the bones? What kind of connective tissue binds them together, etc. Let's start by looking at categories that are based on function, based on the amount of movement. First of all, arthro means joint. Think of arthritis. Arthritis literally means an inflammation of a joint. Think of arthropod. Arthropods are things like insects and millipedes and crustaceans. They have jointed legs. Arthropod literally means jointed leg. Syn, S-Y-N, means a fusion. So a syn arthrosis is where we have an articulation where the two bones have almost fused together. There's very little movement. So in a syn arthrosis, very little movement. We may have bones that are knitted tightly together. We may have fibers that connect the bones together so that there's essentially no motion at all. So some good examples, sutures in the skull. We have bones like the parietal bones that come together and form a suture and the bones are tightly interlaced. And as you age, there's bone that's laid down within that tiny gap between them and they become even more immobile. A gomphosis is where we have a peg-like structure stuck into a hole. And the best example would be a tooth in one of the pits of the mandible or the maxilla. Amphi means both ways or in between. Think of a frog. A frog is an amphibian. It can spend its time in the water. That's probably where it's going to be happiest, but it can also survive on land as well. So it's in between when it comes to being terrestrial or aquatic. An amphiarthrosis is an articulation that's in between being completely immobile and being very mobile. So it's somewhat mobile. A good example would be a symphysis. A symphysis is where we have a connection between two bones that's made out of fibrocartilage. It allows for some movement, but the movement is quite limited. So we have the pubic symphysis between the pubis bones of the hip, and that allows the hip to flex slightly. Incidentally, that is a joint that becomes far more flexible during childbirth to allow the hips to expand. We have connections between the vertebrae, between the body of the vertebrae, and those are known as intervertebral discs, and they allow for some movement. There's not a lot of movement that occurs at each disc, but when we have several of them stretching or compressing, it allows for flexion of the spine. Another example would be the connections between the fibula and tibia. We have this interosseous membrane that holds the bones together, but what we're going to focus on is the connections, the ligaments, at the ends of the bones. So we have a ligament here that holds the bones in place. We have a ligament at the top that does the same thing. There's a little bit of movement there, but not a whole lot. And then finally, we have diarthroses. 
which are more commonly referred to as synovial joints. Here we have lots of movement, and there's an actual physical space between the bones that are articulating, and that space is filled with fluid. The bones have hyaline cartilage on the outside, forming this very slippery layer that allows the bones to slide over each other. So something like the shoulder joint would be an example of a diarthrosis. I should mention that diarthrosis refers to the functional classification of this joint. It means that there's lots of movement. Synovial refers to the structure of the joint, which we'll get to in just a moment. Now let's take a look at the structural classification. Again, this is based on what's connecting the bones together. We have fibrous joints that are held together by dense irregular connective tissue. These joints can be synarthroses with almost no movement or no movement, or they can in some cases be amphiarthroses where there's a little bit of movement. Next we have cartilaginous joints where we have fibrous or hyaline cartilage connecting two bones. Again, these can be synarthroses with next to no movement, but more often they're amphiarthroses with a bit of movement. And then finally we have synovial joints. Synovial joints are defined by the fact that they have a synovial cavity. That synovial cavity is filled with synovial fluid, which is very slippery and allows for lots of movement. These are all diarthritic joints. Fibrous joints consist of two bones that are very close to each other and held together directly by collagen fibers. An example would be a suture. A suture is immobile. It's a synarthrosis when it comes to function. We can also have what are called syndesmoses, and this is where we have a bit of movement. It's an amphiarthrosis. An example would be a gomphosis. So a gomphosis is a tooth in a socket. Now it's important to note that these structures can change in terms of function during development. So when you're an infant or a child, your sutures are somewhat flexible. They are amphiarthroses. And then as you enter into adulthood, they become of course very rigid synarthroses. With the teeth, the teeth in an adult have very little movement. I mean, you can push really hard on your tooth and you might be able to wiggle it a bit, but you probably shouldn't. In a child, when they're losing their deciduous teeth, that connection becomes an amphiarthrosis because the periodontal ligaments that hold the tooth into the socket are breaking down. Next, we have cartilaginous joints. This is where bones are held together by cartilage of some sort. We can have what's called a synchondrosis that's immobile, and it's gonna be formed by hyaline cartilage, or we can have a symphysis that's made out of fibrocartilage where there's some movement. So it's an amphiarthrosis. Finally, we have synovial joints, and this is where the ends of the bones that articulate are covered with hyaline cartilage that creates a very slippery surface. And these joints come in several different types that we'll get to momentarily based on how they move. So we have plane joints and hinge joints, etc. but we'll get to that momentarily. These joints are freely movable, so they are all diarthroses. Let's take a look at fibrous joints and we'll start with sutures. The sutures in the skull are synarthroses in adults. There's no movement there, unless you suffer from a very impactful blow to the head. These are amphiarthroses in infants and children, however. There tends to be a larger gap between the two bones. So we've got two examples here. The first one on the left is the coronal suture, and this is between the parietal bones and the frontal bone of the skull. And notice that the bones knit very closely together. There's very little space there. And in fact, as you age, this suture will go away completely. The bones will completely fuse together. The second example on the right 
is the temporoparietal suture between the temporal bone and the parietal bone. Now this is an interesting suture because the temporal bone actually sort of overrides the parietal bone a bit. They don't line up perfectly. They actually overlap slightly. It's not shown terribly well in that diagram. But there is a bit of movement here, particularly in younger individuals. But it's not a whole lot. Next, we've got syndesmoses. These are fibrous joints with no movement or a very small amount of movement. So synarthroses, like the gomphosis that we see in the tooth example, almost no movement whatsoever, unless you're a child that's about to lose a tooth. And then amphiarthroses, where there's a bit of movement, but in fibrous joints, typically not a whole lot. The example I showed before, when I talked about amphiarthroses, referred to the ligaments that connect the tibia and the fibula together. Interosseous membranes are also an example of a fibrous joint. Remember that os means bone, so interosseous means between bone. So we have this thin sheet of connective tissue that holds the fibula and tibia together. Not a whole lot of movement there, but we have a similar sheet that holds the radius and ulna together. And there is movement here because, of course, when you pronate and supinate your palms, what's happening is the radius is crossing over the ulna. So here there is a fair bit of movement. In this case, the membrane also serves to separate out the muscles of the arm into different compartments. Next, we have cartilaginous joints. We have two types. The first would be synchondroses. Again, syn meaning a fusion. These are joints where there's very little movement. These are joints that are made out of hyaline cartilage. So the first example would be the epiphyseal plate. This is connecting the epiphysis and the diaphysis of a bone. We hope that there won't be any movement there. If there is movement, that's a problem. This is something that's not meant to move. In the second example, we have the connection between the costal cartilage and the rib. Now, I'm not talking about the costal cartilage itself. It will flex a little bit as you breathe in and out, but the connection between the costal cartilage and the rib shouldn't move. If it does, it can cause the costal cartilage to separate from the rib, and that can happen in an accident where there's an impact. When we're dealing with symphyses, we're dealing with a bit of movement. So these are amphiarthroses. The pubic symphysis between the pubis bones would be an example. The intervertebral discs between the vertebrae would be an example. Let's just quickly take a closer look at these cartilaginous joints. Remember, all cartilaginous joints lack a synovial cavity. There's no physical space between the bones. And cartilaginous joints can be made up of fibrocartilage or hyaline cartilage. Synchondroses are going to contain hyaline cartilage. In this example here, we have two epiphyseal plates. What you're seeing is a longitudinal section through the femur of a child. We have one epiphyseal plate that separates the head of the femur from the shaft of the femur, and another epiphyseal plate that separates the greater trochanter from the shaft of the femur. These are structures that both have to grow. And of course, we don't want there to be any movement here. In a symphysis, we do have movement but not a whole lot. So these are amphiarthroses. We have hyaline cartilage, perhaps, but we also have fibrocartilage. So we can have hyaline cartilage that makes direct contact with the bone, but we have fibrocartilage connecting that hyaline cartilage. The pubic symphysis, as I mentioned, is found between the pubis bones of the hip and it's something that's broken down partially 
during childbirth. So just before childbirth, the uh, fibers that connect the two pubis bones together become weakened to allow the hip to expand a bit. And in fact, in some cases, this can actually be broken. This pubic symphysis can be broken, which is rather painful, as you might imagine. We also have these kind of flexible, somewhat flexible connections between the vertebrae, and those are the intervertebral discs. We have these flexible connections between the manubrium and the body of the sternum. If you're breathing very, very heavily, there might be a tiny bit of flexion at that connection. Synovial joints are likely what you think of when you think of a joint. Well, maybe not, but it's a joint with a lot of movement. So we're dealing here with a joint that has a synovial cavity. That cavity is filled with fluid and we have articular cartilage made of hyaline cartilage on the surface of the bones that allows them to move freely past each other. Synovial joints can be further characterized based upon the type of movement that they allow. We have gliding joints, hinge joints, pivot joints, ellipsoid joints, saddle joints, and ball and socket joints. And we'll talk about each of those in turn. In a gliding or plane joint, we have bones sliding across each other in a single plane. The example that's given here is the tarsals, the bones that make up the ankle. Now they don't move a whole lot, but they can slide past each other. There may be a bit of rotation here as well. The other example that was given in the previous table was of the joint between the manubrium and the clavicle. You might not think it, but there is a synovial joint there. There's a little gap between the two bones and there's fluid within it. And we have some slippage that occurs between those bones. A hinge joint is exactly what it sounds like. It allows for movement in one direction, just like the hinge on a door. So we say that it's uniaxial. Motion only occurs along this one axis. The elbow would be a good example of this. So in the elbow, the majority of that hinge joint is made by the connection of the humerus to the ulna. Although realize that the humerus is also hinging with the radius, which we'll talk about in just a moment. A pivot joint allows for rotation. And in many cases, the movement is restricted to rotation. The example you're seeing here would be between the head of the radius and also the distal end of the humerus. So that joint, that elbow joint, is a rather complex joint. We have this uniaxial hinge joint, and then we have a uniaxial rotational joint. Lots of stuff going on. This allows the radius to twist. It's the only bone that's going to twist in that joint and the radius will cross over the ulna and allow you to supinate or pronate your hand. Another fine example of a pivot joint would be the atlantoaxial joint. This is the joint between the atlas and the axis, so the first and second cervical vertebrae of the neck. Remember that the axis has a pin. This pin-like structure is referred to as the dens or the odontoid process. This fits into a little groove in the atlas, and this allows for rotation. Most of the rotational movement in your neck is the result of motion occurring at this joint. So if you're shaking your head no, for instance, almost all of that motion is occurring here. An ellipsoid or condyloid joint is where we have an oval or elliptical raised surface that fits into a matching oval or elliptical depression. And that raised surface is known as a condyle. This sort of joint allows for biaxial movement, so movement in two planes, but at the same time, it allows for a bit more stability than something like a ball joint. At the base of the occipital bone, on either side of the foramen magnum, Remember, that's the big hole that the spinal cord passes through. We have what are known as occipital condyles. 
the occipital condyles are going to articulate with facets on the atlas. The atlas is the first cervical vertebrae. Now looking at the shape of these, you can probably figure out that movement is going to occur readily in one direction to allow nodding of the head. And although there may be some other motions, they're going to be restricted. The shape of the condyles makes this a more stable structure. This is where most of the nodding motion comes from when you nod your head yes. The motions that can occur at a saddle joint are similar to the motions that can occur while you're riding a horse. So imagine yourself in the saddle, your legs on either side. You can lean side to side and slide on the saddle. You could lean forwards and backwards and slide on the saddle, but you're not going to be able to rotate your whole body at least not without the cooperation of the horse. So the most classic example of this is between the metacarpal of the thumb and the trapezium. The trapezium is one of the carpal bones. And if you try it, you can wiggle your finger all over the place, but you can't rotate the metacarpal of the thumb. This allows for a more stable joint, while at the same time still being quite flexible. Finally, we have ball and socket joints, and these allow for a great deal of movement. They allow for rotation while also allowing for movement in all three planes of direction. We have two examples of these joints in our body. We have the joint between the head of the femur and the acetabulum of the coxal bone. And then, of course, we have the shoulder joint, which consists of the head of the femur articulating with the glenoid fossa of the scapula. Of those joints, the shoulder joint is by far the most mobile. We have lots of motion at that joint, but it comes at a price that joint is more likely to be dislocated or disarticulated than other joints. So if we compare that to a really stable joint like the elbow, there's no rotation at all at the elbow and we only have movement in that one plane you can't rotate your humerus relative to your ulna. If you rotate the humerus, your forearm has to turn as well. The synovial cavity is, in part, lined by an epithelial layer known as the synovial membrane. This membrane produces synovial fluid that's going to be found in the synovial cavity, and that fluid will help cushion movements of the articulating bones. Now, it's important to note that the cartilage found on the end of those bones, the articular cartilage, is made up of hyaline cartilage. And as we've talked about before, hyaline cartilage is not well vascularized. In order for the hyaline cartilage to get oxygen and nutrients, it has to get them from diffusion out of the synovial fluid. So in the areolar tissue that underlies the synovial membrane, there are some blood vessels those blood vessels will leak out fluid, plasma, into the areolar connective tissue that surrounds them. Some of that fluid will make its way into the synovial cavity. But as you can imagine, these chondrocytes are not getting as much oxygen or nutrients as they need if they're going to be dividing and growing. So this is a tissue that you want to be quite careful with. If you damage the hyaline cartilage in your joints, it won't repair itself very well in some cases, or it may take a long time to repair itself. In addition to these tissues, we have what's called a fibrous membrane that wraps around the outside of the joint and forms a capsule, and this is continuous with the periosteum. We also have reinforcing ligaments they can be extra capsular if they're outside of the uh, fibrous membrane. They can be intracapsular if they're inside of that membrane, but they're gonna help support the joint and also in some cases prevent it from overextension, from going beyond its preferred range, basically. We also will have some blood vessels that come into that connective tissue and some nerves, but remember no blood vessels or nerves are going to find their way directly to the hyaline cartilage. Here we have a typical synovial joint. This is the articulation between two phalanges. Now note at the end of the bone, 
on the articular surface, we have the articular cartilage, and that's made up of hyaline cartilage. Towards the outside of the synovial cavity, we have the synovial membrane. And this is the epithelial layer that is going to secrete the synovial fluid. Around that, we have this fibrous membrane, and that fibrous membrane is continuous with the periosteum. So that means that this forms a sealed capsule. The shoulder joint is a very complicated joint. There's a lot going on there. And there are actually tendons of muscles that cross the joint. And in order that they're not crushed and damaged by movements of the joint, your body has structures known as bursa. Bursa are these flattened fibrous sacs that contain a small amount of synovial fluid. And they may be found between bones, between bones and tendons, or wrapping around tendons. And as the joint moves, they can actually rotate. And you're seeing that here. So what you're seeing is the head of the humerus rotating. So the arm is being moved and that's causing rotation in the bursa and the bursa is rolling across the surface of the humerus. You may have heard of bursitis before. Bursitis is simply an inflammation of the sac. And of course that can be quite painful and it can limit movement. And finally, here's our terminology list. As always, these are the terms you should focus on when you're studying. There may be a few terms in the PowerPoint on some of the figures that I didn't talk about or that don't appear in this list. You're not responsible for those.